Hey everyone, a really novel and cool uh, invader build idea I came up with. This one's a level 150. It's called the Shinobi Invader. And rather than just making a build that can contend with multiple people at once, with lots of AoE, which I find kind of boring, I decided to try to make a burst stealth invader style where you're going to try to invade more in these linear dungeons and use the Moog's rune here to boost a particular mob. Uh, in this case, uh, I take that pretty tanky guy there. And we're going to try to set traps where we can ambush the host and ideally take them out in one initiating combo. We'll also employ elements of stealth, uh, both by the uh, the trick mirror talisman here that allows us to look like the host so that we can blend in with our background a little bit and position ourselves so that as soon as the enemies engage the mob that we boosted, uh, we can sprout uh, or we can spring in from behind and hopefully take out the host with an initiating combo that completely takes them out before anybody has a chance to respond. So you can take a look at this invasion here and uh, we'll also discuss some of the mechanics and the build a little bit later in the video but uh, you can take a look at this one. We'll be making heavy use of the recusant bloody finger to reposition a lot for this build and also play some mind games. I like to actually scare the host sometimes, letting them see me and then vanishing. Uh, like for example, if I go down an elevator, I'll use this and then while they try to follow me, they find out that I'm gone. But the point is to try to keep the host off their balance and get into a position and set up a trap where uh, we're going to be able to uh, take them out immediately. The build makes heavy use of physical damage and uh, that's largely because the the um, martial art weapon types in this game, they don't do enough damage, to be frank. Um, and you can't really use status buildups as well either because the then you can't really make use of the kick talisman because ha your damage might be getting split. Uh, so if you're going for like a half lightning, half physical, for example, then you're only getting some. Uh, with bleeds, we're not going to get enough hits off quick, quick enough to cause a bleed in our initiating combo, unfortunately, and that's largely because the dry leaf is not properly balanced upon release so it doesn't actually combo itself so if you land the first kicks you're not actually going to be able to land the later kicks they'll be able to roll out in the middle of the ash war which is a little um, unfortunate but hopefully that gets fixed soon uh, in the meantime the build will, will use heavily uh, like the heavy attacks so running heavy kicks jump heavy kicks uh, primarily the running heavy kick just because it's a great initiator with a big little explosion at the end of your feet that can hit multiple people and it also sets you up for following up with the dry leaf assuming that they don't uh, have an easy roll backwards So one of the elements of stealth we'll be using is the talisman that allows you to crouch and be invisible to the host as long as you don't get too close. Here's the range if you're curious so you can know how to play it. Um, so at that range uh, I'm able to see the host who's using the talisman. So we'll be using that along with the uh, host trick mirror to blend in in dark areas. So this is actually my favorite uh, sort of stealth element of this build. You'll be surprised at just how well uh, neutral colors combined with this talisman uh, allow you to just completely ghost uh, enemies and they don't see anything. So here I, I'm just playing with my food as it were and uh, just letting them go past me so that I can find the host and set my ambush trap. Um, so they've obviously got a hunter. Uh, now I do need to drink the wondrous physics so once I do that I'm going to start glowing so I don't have a lot of time once I do that. Uh, and you may have to make a decision on if you want to swap off the talisman for more damage right before you go in. But you can also use elements in the world like waterfalls for example to uh, mask yourself. While you'll be able to see yourself, uh, the enemies and the hosts are going to just see the water here for example. So it's a great way to set a trap uh, this way. And you may not even need the host trick mirror depending on the terrain, uh, but uh, it is a nice little touch that I can point out.
Now I do make a mistake here, I don't actually go for the host. So this build basically has the surprise element to take out one person. You should prioritize the host. I got a little greedy and decided to go for uh, that opponent and underestimated how much damage that uh, long that greatsword was going to do. So here uh, you can see I'm buffing up what I think is a really good mob that I'm hoping can do some damage and cause a distraction. And uh, then I try to find a good position with which I can set up in. The host trick mirror is obviously doing work here. You, it's very easy to blend in with your surroundings. Um, now in this case, I believe the opponents end up going for a different boss, the uh, snake. So I'm going to change up um, and end up going down there pursuing them. But the point is you can actually use the Moog's rune throughout different areas. And you can even create multiple areas where, uh, where they're going to run into the buffed mob. Now, it also has some other benefits, which is if a bleed proc goes off in that vicinity and you're near them, you'll get a 20% attack bonus buff. Now, we don't have bleed innately on our build, but if the enemy's running bleed, it actually works in our favor and makes us even stronger. But uh, it does that, and um, there is another benefit. I believe it's you get life steal as well if bleed goes uh, off as well. So you get like, per each hit, you'll get some life back. Uh, less important for this build, just because we're not looking to trade. We're looking to uh, just do a burst amount of damage. But using the terrain and like surveying and, and taking your time on invasions is part of the really uh, big piece of joy that I think I get out of this build, which is just stalking the opponents. And even if it's just, I end up deciding to take out one of the orange, uh, one of the oranges, the sun bros, um, the, you pick your target based on what's feasible. Like if you see a super heavy build, it might not be possible to take them down quickly. Although this build does hit a very large amount of uh, peak damage on its initiation if it goes well. Be careful with the... Uh, with the Crusade Insignia Talisman, which I'll talk about once I get to the build makeup on this, but if it activates while you're still hoping to keep stealth, you're going to start glowing. So usually that's the talisman that I swap off. Um, keep like keep the Crusade Insignia on the far left, and your third one should be the Rotten Sword Insignia. Um, but uh, yeah, the point is, don't activate that until you're until you're in position and you're and they're about to kill the mob that you want to uh, get the damage bonus from for that for that talisman. It synergizes really well with the, with the Moog's rune in addition, so that's another uh, interesting difference about this build that you don't see very often or ever. We have a couple of tools for when we in, uh, enter an invasion, we're just like wildly out of place. Either we're right beside all three and we can't activate the bloody recusant finger. Uh, here, for example, I have the host trick mirror still on. I haven't had a chance to put on my damaging talisman. It's not the end of the world because you do so much damage with this build um, that it, it it's not essential you end up getting it on. It's just a really nice touch and depending on how tanky they are, the more important they might be. Here we can see how Dryleaf uh, Whirlwind is really good when you have them in a corner because while they can roll some of it, they'll usually at least take uh, another portion of the Ashabor. So while it doesn't do a ton of damage outright, it does do reliable damage when you have them boxed in and uh, can f guarantee to finish them in a lot of cases.
another really uh, niche use here. So using throwing daggers as well as uh, the other items in your consumable list all come into play a lot for this build. So for example, throwing daggers are great for knocking people off ladders as they try to climb away from you, but they also are really good at uh, chipping poise damage so that our light attacks will guaranteed stun even like tanks and people in heavy armor. So if you see people that are extremely beefy and have a lot of poise, soften them up with a couple throwing daggers before going in for your uh, initiation each time if you can. Let's take a look at the build's uh, stats, equipment, etc., everything, and uh, we'll just cover why everything is being used, and um, we'll go from there. So first off, let's start with the stats. This is a level 150 build, um, but it is adapted a little bit just so that you can play through PvE with it as well. So we're going to be running Morgoth's Great Rune when we're running PvE, which is why you have five levels off of things like Vigor. Um, and uh, the reason that mind is where it is, this all comes together to factor in those uh, needs that we have in single player. So a couple examples, I like to run uh, the uh, Dung Eater as my support summon, and that's because they have a weakening war cry that uh, is really synergizes really well with uh, the fact that I'm all physical damage. We'll leave some room so that the plus five will get us to the soft cap and vigor, but uh, the endurance is dialed in so that when I'm invading, I have just enough to keep myself light rolling at the max weight that I can make uh, use of the blue dancer charm, so at 16 pounds. The, uh, you will change talismans and maybe potentially some other, like a weapon slot or something. And so I, right now I'm at 14.7, but you will find that you might want to swap some items out here and there, uh, or like have a day, a misericord or something for crits instead. Anyways, the endurance is set there. Uh, the build is quality and you might be wondering why we don't run like bleed or something, given that we're doing multi hit. It's because we need the initiating combo to do all the damage we're going to do. We don't really have time to wait for a status proc and we don't usually have time to do something like seppuku when our moment to strike is in front of us we have to act fast we already have a small delay with drinking the wondrous physic so we want to be able to pounce quickly and not need a bunch of buffs although we do have them for single player largely intelligence is so that you can swap to the smith script throwing dagger so i do like this instead of the horaloo sometimes just because it's really good for following up when my combo didn't quite finish them off i can just press right on the d-pad and throw a light attack and finish them off at range uh, but i did need 11 intelligence in order to do that and then faith is so that we can run uh flame grant me strength and get that physical damage bonus um we won't often use it in pvp just because we don't have time but um Sometimes it might be there, or if there's like a tank that we need to take down, but uh, it's largely there for PvE. Uh, and then FP-wise, with Morgoth's Rune activated, we'll have just enough to summon Dung Eater, like I said. We'll also run four Mana Flasks when, in, when doing PvE, but in PvP we only realistically need one Mana Flask, so uh, we'll only leave the two there to, to be dropped down to one when we're doing PvP. Okay, so uh, talismans, let's talk about these. So the blue dancer talisman was part of the build challenge for myself on this one. And like I said, you can only realistically have 16 weight. Given that we're gonna be going that light, then we might as well try to make sure we're light loading. So that's why we run the endurance that we do. But this is gonna boost all physical damage, not just our um, uh, attack directly so things like these uh, consumables will also get a benefit um that one's never going to change and neither is the shattered stone talisman just because the build is making use of kick so aggressively so um you will be trying to use heavy attacks for the most part with uh, dane's quality footwork keep in mind as that will get you all the kicks right away whereas some of the light attacks will feature some punches and uh, more often Rotten Wing Sword Insignia. So if you land the 
double attack that's part of your running heavy which is your most common opener uh that will activate that'll proc the first bonus to this talisman it isn't worth running millicent in conjunction just because the benefits in millicent are so low this one we can actually justify it though because if we land the uh double kick then that means the start of our whirlwind ash of war will have that benefit that ash of war will also increase the proc so that the final kick also gets the uh benefit of uh the rotten wings or insignia's max um benefit the fourth, uh, the fourth talisman here. Oh, and I should probably mention this has really high AR bonus. So that's largely what we're going for in this build. Um, it's just to boost AR as much as possible. So the fourth talisman gets changed depending on what you're doing during the invasion. Um, there are, I would say, three combat talismans. You're either, or actually maybe four. So Shard of Alexander is your primary one. But note that it's actually not as good as it might look because they FromSoft hasn't made dry leaf whirlwind true combo itself it doesn't actually land all of its hits if you land the first ones so if you use this it should be giving us 15 percent more damage to that ash of war but because we only end up getting about half the ash of war's damage this only ends up giving us about eight percent effectively so this is your default when you have nothing better to use but it is not something we typically want to have to use it does however have the benefit of boosting horaloo for us so that's one of the reasons why it's the defaults when you load in sometimes you have to just immediately swap to horaloo um in our second hard swap weapon and just take out them quickly uh, the best one to have the opportunity to do if you can set the circumstance up is the Crusade Insignia. So combine this with Moog's Great Rune and uh, wait by the mob that the mob group that you want to uh, ambush the host at. Let them kill one mob and then hopefully a strong mob that you've boosted is there as well. Sometimes you won't have one, but uh, the point is let them kill a weak mob and have a strong mob that you can uh, either have backing up when you go in for your initiation. Uh, in a pinch, sometimes you just have to let them kill the, the strong mob, but um, ideally that's uh, we're going to try to get the benefit of this because it's 15% more attack power for 20 seconds. So timing our initiation so that we drink our wondrous physic right before they kill some mobs is the long game here. It's okay if you're a little early. You can always use your healing flasks. We're not going to use them all most of the time because this build really does rely on just taking out the host. It's all or nothing when you go in for your ambush. If there are no mobs, um, then another one you might consider is the Stamina Talisman, because this build does have some stamina issues. The um, We do want to keep as much of our stats out of Endurance, and the Dry Leaf, uh, or sorry, Dane's Footwork, does have the benefit of not using a lot of stamina for its regular attacks. But because our bar is so low, um, we we can burn through it especially if we use the ash of war and there is another reason we're going to want this one potentially which is for deflect hard uh, guard counters but i'll get to that in a sec the last talisman that you might use for combat is if they're running a shield you'll swap to the hammer talisman so that you can break down their guard quicker and get your crits in uh, as quickly as possible Okay, so moving on to uh, the stealth talisman. So when the map first loads in and you've got your Shard of Alexander, the first thing you're gonna do is take stock of if you're under attack right away, in which case you're gonna hard swap to Horaloo and just hopefully take them out that way. Ideally though, we want uh, if we if they're not right in front of us or if we have the opportunity, we can also use the uh, recusant finger to teleport and try to reposition. We will be using those aggressively uh, while we set up our ambush. But um, moving on, so if, uh, Assuming that you're stable and you can take your time, you'll take positions and try to find where, where the host is while using one of the stealth talismans. The most reliable is probably the furled finger trick mirror here. It makes you look like the host, but more importantly, lets us blend into our backgrounds, especially in certain areas, like in caves that are dark. Um, but if they're very, if you know they're very far away, like you're not in like around corners and whatnot, and just going through hallways, you can use the concealing veil instead which uh, you can use to crawl around the map and keep an eye on your opponents. It's especially useful for crossing open fields and areas where you're very likely to get spotted if uh, you try to move. So we'll use the Concealing Veil in those cases. Once we're, if we are in an area where it's worth giving up some of like the 4,000 slots damage or the stamina, um, especially if the host is like a fragile build, then you may just want to go for more uh, ambush potential by using the... Uh, just keeping the host trick mirror and positioning in such a way near the mob that you're going to boost with Moog's Rune and uh, just keeping this talisman on. But uh, usually they'll be pretty quick to spot you once the fight started, so I usually end, end up swapping this uh, to the Crusade Insignia if I have the ability to set up an ambush. 
Okay, uh, consumables. So uh, the throwing dagger, like I mentioned, is really good for knocking people off ladders and poise proccing. The fan dagger is very good for popping bubbles. So when people use perfumes or their wondrous physic has the opaline, I think it's called, it's not the opaline, it's the other one, um, that gives you just the one-time shield. Uh, if you do your opening combo and it's not enough to kill them, having this already selected before you go in is a useful idea. It'll make it so that as soon as you do your running kick into dry leaf whirlwind throw this as long as there isn't another um friendly for the host nearby and you can prevent them from using any health potions and really help speed up your chase down and finish them off upload uh, uplifting this is just in case we're going into a very dangerous fight always need this the mimic veil is useful but because we have a lot of buffs that'll be activating giving us those light auras uh i find it's not quite as useful i still have it for like choke moments where i just don't want to get spotted and i'm like trapped Rainbow stones are for mind games and sort of like kind of lure them over to areas um, and get them positioned where we want them. And then hefty fire pots or any other real pot here is for knocking people off of ledges and uh, like drop down areas, elevators, etc. We'll talk about the wondrous physic here now. So we're going to be using the blood sucking crack here just because it is the craziest AR buff possible it's 20 percent now it does mean that we're bleeding health as soon as we drink it so again we only want to drink this right before we initiate and uh have already swapped our talisman to the ones we want when we initiate the deflecting hard tier you could swap out for the consecutive hit talisman i think it's called the uh, thorny tier or something like that but I do find that the deflecting hard tier is more flexible because there are some builds where once we initiate, they're just going to try to start trading into us. So for those ones, what we'll do is we'll just do the running hard kick. They will probably attempt to swing at it, like especially with colossal weapons. Uh, you got to be careful not to use the Ash of War because you'll drain too much stamina. But uh, instead, go for a perfect block into guard counter and you'll do like 1200 damage with that. Um, and that's usually enough to, if not kill, then very close to. You can definitely follow up with the dry leaf uh, whirlwind at that point and finish them off in most cases, or a running hard kick depending on their builds, or uh, or any of your other tools. To be frank, like even your consumables can oftentimes do it too. So that about covers it. Now I'll just show a bunch of invasion clips of putting uh, the build into practice and um, showing you just not only the damage potential that you can finally make with uh, the martial art and hand-to-hand -hand weapon type. It definitely needs a buff, but uh, with if we squeeze out this many different uh, forms of buffs, then we are able to do some pretty good damage and ambush hosts down and make the uh, shinobi style work in our favor. So enjoy the invasions.
All right, this is The Last Invasion. So uh, if you like this video, like and subscribe. And uh, I play a lot of different FromSoft games, but uh, as of now, I'm playing some Elden Ring. Probably jump back in Armored Core shortly, and uh, hopefully see you guys there.